Let's talk about why visceral fat is different. Get into the physiology and talk about why that is so dangerous. So there's two kinds of fat that are, there's, there's three kinds of main fat. There's white fat, which is wiggly and jiggly. Uh, and it can be visceral or it could be subcutaneous, meaning under the skin. And then there's brown fat, which is paper thin and it's close to the bone. And it actually is good fat that generates heat to burn down harmful fat. But visceral fat is really the f- first kind. It's wiggly jiggly and, it, and it's found inside the tube of your body. Visceral meaning gut, gut fat. Visceral fat's the same thing. And if you think about it, it starts off like packing peanuts in, inside the tube of your body. It's a cushion to prevent if you tripped on a rug and you fell on the floor, your organs are cushioned by a little bit of these packing peanuts. And so it's going to be fine. Now, visceral fat, by the way, has another function. It actually contains part of our immune system. I want to talk about the good part first. Our immune system, um, and, and I can tell you what it does. There's a specific organ. There's even an org, a sub-organ of, of fat. Our whole fat is an organ. There's one part of our fat called the omentum, O-M-E-N-T-U-M. Most people who are not doctors will have never heard of it because it is actually what we – it's like an apron of fat, healthy fat, that crawls around our body like an octopus. You know, if you see those uh, videos online or on, on like uh, Discovery Channel, the octopus uh, is going around the rock and the reef – just looking for places the crevice, crevices to go into. That's the omentum made out of body fat. Here's what it does. It patrols our abdomen, our, our belly on the inside around our intestines doing a couple of things. Number one, it conducts surveillance to make sure there are no leaks or cracks or injuries to our gut. You know, our gut is full of bacteria and our gut is actually full of poop. Can you imagine if there's a perforation, a tiny hole or an injury and all that bacteria seeps out? from inside, from the tube of your intestines into the viscera, into the open cavity of your body. I'll tell you as a doctor what would happen. You would get septic, you would go to the ICU, and there's a good chance you would die. All right? So thank goodness for the the omentum, this healthy fat, this octopus. Um, it's kind of like a mix between an octopus and a baseball glove. And it basically cruises around your belly silently. You can't feel it. And it can get in between the intestines. Now, look, your intestines is about 40 feet of a tube, all folded up, like packed into a suitcase, which is our our belly. And the omentum conducts surveillance to make sure that everything is hunky-dory and actually fine and there's no inflammation. Now, the, the, the omentum also, this is visceral fat, also secretes those hormones, leptin, to help control our appetite, adiponectin, which is another hormone to allow insulin to draw our uh, energy in, our fuel, our glucose more efficiently into our cell and resistant, which is actually to allow us to have a little bit less versus a little bit more um, uh, energy drawn in. Okay, this is all healthy stuff. Now, the other thing that Omentum contains, it actually contains part of our immune system. So think of it, our Omentum like a battleship that contains ready to roll super soldiers inside its, um, in, inside its cav, in, inside the ship. And basically, it's waiting there, and if it actually finds a little hole in our intestines, right? Think about all the stuff that we actually throw down our gut. If there's a little hole, a little perforation, immediately that octopus, the omentum, will crawl over there. It'll stick out a tentacle, and it will cup that cup area, and it will blast the super soldiers, the immune system, to clean up that area and kill the infection until it heals, All right. We used to call this the policeman of the abdomen, the omentum. So it's quite amazing. So, okay. So what happens, um, that's normal. I'm just, I want to tell you normal because everybody thinks of fat as bad. That's all normal. If you actually grow too much visceral fat, and visceral fat also being fuel cells, and you just keep on piling up fat, 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 fat by overeating, by eating the wrong things, by disrupting your gut health, which then causes your metabolism to go haywire, and then it's easier to gain, uh, to develop body fat, then what actually happens is that those hormonal functions are disrupted. Basically, think about it like uh, disrupting the hormones, like getting too much visceral fat is like you walk into a symphony hall that's in the middle of a performance of, you know, Beethoven's uh, uh, symphony, and you get in there and you just jump on stage and start throwing, you know, stuff around, uh, amping a garbage can on stage. You're going to disrupt everything. The music is not going to flow. And that's what actually happens when you develop excess visceral fat. It's dangerous for several reasons. Number one, those hormones. Leptin, adiponectin, resistant, all the things that control how well and efficiently we use our energy, 
all thrown off course. I don't know. Do we want to absorb more energy or less energy? I can't tell. It's too noisy in here. All right. That, the immune system super soldiers. Well, guess what? They're thrown out of whack as well. They're like, whoa, I can't, I don't know what's going on. And so basically your fat unleashes the super soldiers as inflammation. All right. Now you've got inflammation instead of defenders of the, of your body. Now they become inflammatory cells and they are all over the place, spilling out over your uh, guts. On top of that, when you, if you grow too much visceral fat, and remember, fat normally is a fuel tank that stores the energy into fat cells. If you, if you overstuff that area, the fuel, the fat will leak out. Okay. It's just like overfilling your gas tank at a gas station. Boom. It comes out. Full, rolls down the side of the of the car, around your tires, around your shoes. You're, it's a toxic, dangerous, flammable mess at the gas station. Same deal. When you have overflowing fuel, fat will leak out of fat. A liquid will leak out of fat cells, which is supposed to contain them like a fuel tank. And that leaking fat poisons your liver. It's called lipo, meaning fat. Toxicity, meaning it's poison to your liver. And in fact, that's actually the cause in our world of abundance of something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD. That's just, this is actually a hidden epidemic that is leading to hepatitis and leading to liver cancer when you poison your liver. And by the way, your liver detoxifies your whole body, detoxifies your blood. You damage that organ with leaking excess fat, man, we are in a world of hurt. So what I'm telling you is that Normal healthy fat, think about it like a orchestra um, with a conductor that plays a beautiful symphony. Everybody's in harmony doing their thing, and it's a performance for the, your whole life. And when you actually grow too much visceral fat, it's like rushing on stage with garbage cans and dumping them out and completely disrupting the performance. That's how bad it actually is. I know another reason that people get fatty liver is from too much fructose. Can you talk about that mechanism and how is there any overlap between the two? Yeah. So, you know, I think uh, it is true that if you overload with carbs, including fructose, but also added sugar of any sort, you can actually overwhelm your metabolism, which can then lead the liver to be less efficient and then lead to the accumulation of fat, which leaks, which then leads to fatty liver disease. So in fact, the process I told you about, regardless if it's fructose or sucrose or, you know, any kind of uh, OS, which is uh, sugars and carbs, it all start, stems from the same thing. It's fuel. It gets stored into the fuel tank. It leaks out and then it poisons and, over, and, 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 and is toxic to the liver. So it's not that eating a piece of fruit actually does it because there's something special about the fruit. It's the, it's a general overwhelming of it. And fructose, by the way, um, uh, consumed in you know, it gets vilified, just like people tend to do in the nutrition and food and health world. Actually, it's perfectly fine for most people with normal, healthy metabolisms. You know, there are plenty of people who are in their 80s and 90s and above who actually eat fruit without, you know, poisoning their liver. The problem is when you start out, you know, with the scales tip against you as an adult with bad eating habits, not enough exercise, poor sleep, Oh, an excessive amount of stress. And then, you know, you start to overeat as well. All those things are like the four horsemen of the apocalypse that converge to help you grow that extra body fat, which then leaks and causes inflammation. And of course, inflammation being the, the sort of setting the stage for almost every other undesirable chronic disease that we know. Well, let's zoom back then. Now we know what happens when the visceral fat gets out of control and the damage it can cause. But let's zoom back and talk about the dietary piece, what we're consuming and when we're consuming that's causing that visceral fat to accumulate. So the simple analogy I like to give people to think about our metabolism. So set aside calories in, calories out, counting calories. There's so much, uh, there's so much uh, baggage associated with the term calorie. Think about your body like an engine of a car and the food that you eat providing the fuel. When your fuel is low, it's like a fuel, like a, like your gas tank, your gas gauge in your car. When you see it's low, we feel hungry. We pull over to the filling station, which is not a gas station. In the case of our metabolism, it's really to the kitchen table, the refrigerator, the pantry, the restaurant, what have you to go eat something. Now, here's the thing. When we actually eat food, 
any put put start approaching food and and put it into our mouth. Our, our pancreas, which one of the organs in our body, secretes a hormone called insulin. When insulin goes up, it allows it's a hormone that allows our body to absorb the energy from the food, the fuel that we eat. Food equals fuel. Fuel is into food. Now we're actually taking the fuel into our cells, so we have energy. Blinking, uh, talking, rushing to catch an airplane, going out for a walk, working out. All those things take fuel. Just pumping your heart actually takes fuel. So so you lo- use that fuel. Insulin uses that, brings that fuel in. And anything extra from whatever you're eating, all right, no matter how many calories it is, gets stored in for later use in your body fat. And so little fat cells are called adipocytes. And when you've got extra fuel from whatever you're eating that's not useful at the moment, you store it into a little fat cell. And that fat cell it's a little cell, but it'll grow a hundred times in size when it's being loaded up with fuel. That's uh, food from the from the food that we're eating, and you can load that up when you're done eating. You're done fueling up. Insulin basically comes down, and your body go, can go from switch from your metabolism switches from fuel storing mode, okay, to fuel burning mode. Just like when you're in a car, when you're filling up your gas tank, you're told to turn off the engine, right? And now you're in fuel storing mode. When you're done fueling up, the thing clicks and you put the nozzle back, close the gas cap, get back in the car. Now you can switch to fuel burning mode. So that's basically in our body. When we're eating, our insulin's up, metabolism says, uh, let's not burn any fuel, let's store it. We want to store it. Bring it on, baby. When we actually are done eating, our insulin goes down, and that's a signal for our metabolism to switch gears, and now it switches to fuel burning mode. And that makes sense. When we're not eating, we need to have a source of energy. And so we just draw on the fuel that's stored in our fat. Now, if we eat normal amounts, we fill up our fuel tank. Let's call it three quarters full. The tank is full. All right. Maybe a little bit higher than that. But what happens for overeating from a habit perspective? If we overeat, we are overfilling our gas tank. Imagine if in your car, you didn't have the clicker at the end of the gas station and the fuel just kept on going up to fill up and then overflow the tank. The gas will run down the car and you'll be standing in this dangerous, flammable mess in your body. Remember, I told you about leaking fuel. All right. Instead of leaking at the very beginning, what happens is that your body goes, let's go fill up another fuel tank, another fat cell, another fat cell. Oh, still eating? Still more fuel? All right. Let's fill up another one. You can kind of see what's going on from one cell, a hundred times bigger, another cell, a hundred times bigger, so on and so forth. Repeat, rinse and repeat. Now you've run out of fat uh, storage tanks. Oops, still eating, right? I mean, like we've all been through this ourselves at some point in our lives. You're still eating, dude? All right, now what happens is your your body says, look, uh, we're really grateful when we have more fuel. We're not going to waste any. So let's take some stem cells that live in our body and let's go make some more fat, all right? So more fat cells. Now it makes more fat cells, more fat cells, more fat cells, and fills them up. As long as you're eating, it'll keep on filling up the fat. That's how we build up first extra visceral fat, but eventually it'll spill to the other kinds of fat as well. The bigger the fat, the bigger the mound, okay, and this could be inside your butt belly with visceral fat. What winds up happening is that your fat, as it expands, can outgrow its own blood supply. Your fat needs a blood supply to live when it's expanding that quickly because you're filling it up. It, it, the, the, the outside gets big, but there doesn't have enough blood vessels. So what happens? The center of it, which is, doesn't have enough blood flow, winds up dying. It won't die completely, but it's called ischemia, hypoxia, not enough oxygen. And so when it's not enough oxygen, guess what it does? It, your fat basically says, release inflammation. So now inflammation is unleashed inside your necrotic dying fat as it's expanding. And then the inflammation starts seeping out as well. Leakage of growing fat, excessive fat, of, of fat fuel itself, as well as inflammation. That sets the stage for all these problems, heart disease, diabetes, frank obesity, uh, probably Alzheimer's and neurodegeneration, a whole host of things. And then your immune system starts to crash, and then your health defenses start to crash, and your metabolism crashes. And when your metabolism crashes, your energy starts to really flag. Uh, and and uh, and then your gut health also starts to flag. This is the interconnectedness of all of our systems. I know it's so tempting, and we do this all the time to vilify this or that, and it's either a hero or it's a villain. Actually, no. There's a lot of body parts that are interconnected. What we want is everything to work in harmony together.
And the interesting thing, as you explain that, we can see how everything can be working for us or it can quickly flip the other way. And if we get to that point where, you know, we have inflammation and our metabolism starts to come down, we're going to start to put more weight on and that's going to cause more inflammation. And you can see how this could all spiral out of control if somebody lets this get out of hand. So yeah, I, mean, I feel for people and I can see how it would easily get there. The problems can happen very silently, right? Because life happens to us, right? I mean, this is what happens. Why? So between 20 and 60, when metabolism is hardwired to be stable, and yet people do struggle with their weight, they, and they feel like their metabolism is slowing down. This is why we used to think, oh, when we're middle age, we're nat our metabolism naturally slows. No, actually what happens, our metabolism doesn't slow. It actually is hardwired to be completely stable, operating system on your laptop. The problem is life happens to us. We get distracted. We get stressed financial stress, economic stress, uh, relationship stress. You've got kids you're worried about, job stress. You know, there's whatever's going on in the world. All these things, uh, you know, we've got more complexity. And what happens is that over time, we start to change our behavior. When our behavior changes, it's very easy to start eating overeating. And especially if you're not eating the right things, now you're overeating the wrong things. It's so easy to go to that old fuel overloading inflammatory, uh, fat overspillage, damaging your metabolism stage. And that's why overeating and excess body fat crushes your metabolism, not the other way around. And I think it's important to point out too, that this system is actually trying to work for us. And a lot of the time throughout our history, it would have worked for us when we didn't have such an abundance of food. And we could go up to the fridge and, you know, every couple hours, open it up and continue to put calories in and spike that insulin, as you talked about, and go into storage mode. We would have needed this system to get through to where we are today as humans. It's only in the last little period of time that because of our new way of living, it's easy enough to throw the system awry. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. 60 can be the new 20 if you follow your metabolism. And it's the problem of excess body fat that actually shuts down, sits on top of our metabolism. So it's not that a slow metabolism causes us to grow body fat and gain.